right outside the front door is this gigantic uh, picture of uh, this Indian god that is standing inside of a portal, walking through. Hmm. So I think they kind of knew what they were gonna be doing when they started this whole building and started this whole uh, project, um, but they just kind of kept it low key to the general public. This type of research without complete oversight, to me is scary stuff, man. I mean, me you don't even know what can come through. CERN is the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. It's the largest machine in the world located in Switzerland. And it's all underground. And it uses this gigantic track of this underground tube that's connected. And they send atoms in opposite directions and speed them up to a percentage of the speed of light and then let them collide. And then they analyze the collision to see what comes out of this collision between atoms you know, quarks and muons and everything else that they discover. But something else they discover in this, in the process is that they create microscopic black holes. So originally a lot of people were getting scared about this because they were like, man, if you guys create a black hole here on earth, will it suck the earth in? I mean, kind of fear to assume like black holes are supposed to be pretty deadly things. Even light can't escape them. Mm -hmm. So why create one here on earth? But I think in my opinion, is that part of the work going on at CERN is to learn how to create stable wormholes. What Einstein and Rosen called an Einstein-Rosen bridge, where you take space and you fold it and make a hole, punch a hole in between to make a connection, a shortcut through space-time. And so it could be you know, learning or trying to experiment, either by accident or on purpose, how to create a stable wormhole. How do you create one and hold it open? The hold biggest on. thing is holding it open. You take a piece of paper, bend it like this. So you had a pencil, you could poke a hole right through. So you can go from point A to point B. Instead of traveling over the length of that sheet of paper to get fine, and another professor, another a theoretical physicist named Rosen, they, they call it the Einstein-Rosen bridge, was a theoretical name for this, um, for this type of hypothesis on how to create a wormhole or what a wormhole would be, how it would operate, how it would work. The biggest problem that we have is not creating the wormhole now because we can create them but how do you keep how do you keep it open? How do you make it stable for something to pass through without collapsing? Now, NASA recently discovered something called X points around Earth and also around the sun. These are naturally occurring portals, portals that open and close every single day all around the outside of our planet. The FEMA satellite system discovered these portals a few years back and I'd have been analyzing and watching them. Some of them create direct pathways to the sun and even to other planets in our solar system. So these are called X points. They exist all around the outside of our planet. They're where magnetic diffusion points hit and cross, like our magnetic fields hit and cross. In some way, combining that crossing of electromagnetic fields with charged particles from the sun opens up a portal. So portals naturally can occur in nature. You don't have to make them artificially. So that's pretty interesting. All we have to do now is learn how to harness that power and we can travel through space. We can go great distances without having to put ourselves in hibernation pods and things like that. Mm -hmm. But now what's interesting is you look at some of the pyramid structures and also read the ancient texts. If you go to one of the Sumerian tablets, they talk about having something called a Duran key. It was called a bond heaven earth. And Enlil talks about walking from his home world directly to Earth and walking from Earth directly back to his home world, bypassing even getting in a spaceship. You go fast forward a little bit more, the ancient Egyptians talk about something called a Jed Pillar Ankh. They have a Jed connected to the inside of Ankh. People think the Ankh was like for decoration or represented rebirth and the womb of a woman and all that. It kind of did. Nowadays, it's just decoration like jewelry. <laughs> but it also represented something more technological in the ancient times. When you go to the super ancient texts, you discover that that Ankh and that Jed were a oscillator that would resonate to the atomic frequency of the owner. That was the code programmed into the actual Ankh. Only the elite of the elite had access to these portals to, to travel all around the world. There's one in Mexico, in Tula, Mexico, where Thoth the Atlantean, who came from Africa over there, he would stand there and this looks like an indention in a wall, and he would literally walk through it, and he would reappear somewhere else in the world, and he would come back from time to time and so forth. But again, he would have the Jed Pillar Ankh in his hand. Then you look at Bosnia in Europe. There's a pyramid there called the Pyramid of the Sun, just like the one, there's, there's one in Mexico called the Pyramid of the Sun. There's one in Bosnia called the Pyramid of the Sun. It's massive. 
In this valley, there's like five massive pyramids all covered with brush and trees and debris. Well, they started digging this thing out. They said, oh my God, these are solid stone blocks. There's tunnels underneath that are connecting the pyramids. The same exact tunnels that are in Teotihuacan in Mexico connecting the pyramid structures there. But inside of this one tunnel, they found this gigantic crystal. It's called the K2 megalith. And on it is written in runes, an ancient writing. It says, we must sta stand in defense until we can open the gate. Well, what gate are they talking about? I believe they're talking about the Stargate. But this, this K2 megalith, this gigantic crystal, it has something to do with activating the portal at this Pyramid of the Sun in Bosnia, which at some point they were defending it and trying to thwart some people from getting access to it until they can get it activated so they can walk through themselves. Pretty interesting stuff. And this is well documented, the K2 megalith gigantic crystal. So CERN, in my opinion, is researching and learning about technologies that already existed. Again, we're just rediscovering everything. There was something interesting before we go on. There was a field trip of sorts, a tour to let people come in and look around. And as one person was looking around, they saw these gigantic clear panels. They don't know what material they were made out of. And I have a picture of them leaning up against the side of a part of the machine with these hieroglyphs on them. So they sent these hieroglyphs out. Everyone, including I've sent the hieroglyphs out. Nobody can decipher these hieroglyphs. Nobody knows what in the world these are, what they mean, where they came from, who wrote them, what writing, what ancient culture are they linked to? Nobody knows. Massive, giant, clear plates leaning up against the machine. At the front door, gigantic portal, a representation of a portal with one of these ancient Indian gods walking through it. They are just, in my opinion, learning about these creation of portals, learning how to create st stable wormholes, um, just like all experimenting, just trying to figure out how do we, what type of energy can we inject into a, a one of these holes that will stabilize it, maybe even expand it? And where, where do they lead? Where do they go? Like when we go through them, where will we end up? Maybe they're sending small probes through or things through to take a look. Maybe they're sending nano probes into them. This type of research without complete oversight to me, it's scary stuff, man. I mean, you don't even know what can come through, like life in other worlds and also life in even other dimensions. Dimension is the realm that exists at a different frequency. Right now, we're in the third dimension. We only can control the first and the second, all right? The first dimension is a line. The second dimension is connected lines. And because we're in the third dimension, we can, we, we're like the God over the second and the first. We can control and manipulate those dimensions from the outside. If people were living in those dimensions, like one dimensional people or two dimensional people, they would be at complete awe of what our capabilities were because they, they, first of all, they wouldn't be able to see us as a third dimensional being. All they would see is the manipulation of their environment and they would wonder what's going on. All right, so that's the kind of power we would have. Everything that exists in the third dimension that we took part in creating, it started all on the multi-dimensional platform. So this chair that we're sitting in right now, a person thought about this chair first before, before it manifested as solid matter, but they thought about it on the multi-dimensional platform, higher dimensional thinking, the original platform before all these other platforms came out. And in that realm, it existed and was constructed in a higher dimension. Then what happens is the person who was thinking about creating this chair collapsed it from multi-dimensions into two dimensions. How? By drawing it on a piece of paper. Then it went from there probably into a computer. And from there it gets sent, now the data from it gets sent to an engineer who now crafts it into a three-dimensional object that we can maneuver in XYZ axis in space time. So this chair that I'm sitting in and you're sitting in started off, it was created in multi-dimensions and then collapsed into a three-dimensional structure that we're sitting on right now. Now, extrapolate fourth dimension. The fourth dimension used to be said it was time. It's not time. That's just a hypothesis that Einstein was trying to correlate time to the third. The fourth dimension is a tesseract, a fourth dimensional hypercube. From the fourth dimension and all the way up, things change completely. So we're in the third. Somebody in the fourth dimension, an entity in the fourth dimension, can see into everything. They can see through this ceiling and watch us sitting here right now. All right? They can see the past, present, and future all at the same time. It's like having a house and living different parts of your life at the same time in different years in the same house. So if there are beings in higher dimensions that have developed the ability to understand and get the actual 
subatomic frequency number of the third dimension in this universe, they can theoretically walk from their universe or their dimension directly into ours. Every universe has a specific frequency. Every dimension in that same universe also has a frequency. Every atom resonates at a specific frequency. Nothing ever rests, everything is always vibrating. At the subatomic level, we know that when you dig deep into the nucleus of an actual atom, what's in there is a tiny vibrating string. So we're living in a symphony of music, and the music that's jingling and making this noise is creating the illusion of physicality, the illusion of solidity, even the illusion of distance, which doesn't even exist. And so that's what we're living in. Now, let's say there's a cancer tumor in a person's body. The cells in that cancerous tumor are now operating or vibrating at a specific resonant frequency. We know this for a fact. If I have a device that actually can match the frequency of that tumor, I can send a cancellation frequency to that tumor, something like a red machine. I can destroy it without destroying the surrounding tissue, right? So imagine having the capability of now understanding on a more grand scale, a dimension, fifth dimension, like somebody there obtains the frequency of the third dimension. They can just come right on through.